song is a reminder, letter G, letter G, and that is, we're not home yet, children. We're not home yet, children. This old world is filled with disappointments and troubles every day. Many times I get discouraged and I almost lose my way. Then I remember I'm just a pilgrim in this troubled world below. That's the reason I keep singing as I go. Help us sing today? You know? Okay. All right, we're going to sing the text that we're going to be preaching on today. And you're welcome to sing along with us. And that is Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. <clears throat> Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Hopefully you know where that is today. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I was actually praying last night where God would have me to go today. And this seemed to be where he, he led me. And we start our message today with a question. And the question that we ask is this. What is your main focus in life right now? Just answer it to yourself. What is your main focus in life right now? In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus mentioned some things that people focus upon. Uh, for the upper end of society, in verses 19 through 24 of Matthew chapter 6, we see a focus on wealth, and that is just laying up treasures here on this earth. In verses 25 through 32, Jesus focuses on the lower end of society, and that is those who are working for food and for drink and for clothing and for basic necessities. So what we see here is, whether we find ourselves as 
rich or poor or, or somewhere in between, what Jesus is saying is it's easy to get sucked into living for what this world has to give us. So in verse number 33, whether you're rich, poor, middle class, wherever you find yourself, Jesus challenges us to focus our lives somewhere other than this world. And what Jesus calls upon his followers to do is to focus their lives on pursuing his kingdom and his righteousness. And we're going to look into that today and see exactly what that means and how we can apply it to our lives. I'll ask you to stand if you're able. And since we're just reading one verse, I'll ask you to read it with me. We'll read it through twice. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. One more time. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we live in a world that is currently being manipulated by the greatest distractor, and that is the devil, Satan. And it seems like today, uh, whether it's a ding or a screen or whether it's a phone ring or whether it's some sort of a emergency or this, that, or the other, that there are a lot of distractions out there in this world. And people's nature hasn't changed. We live for what's before us, what we can feel, and not for you. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, you would challenge us today by your Holy Spirit, first of all, to make sure that we've been declared righteous through our Lord Jesus Christ. But secondly, if we're Christians, we pray that we would also be challenged to focus on living righteously through the power of your Holy Spirit. Help this preacher today to go where you'd have him to go, to say what you'd have him to say. And may the words that come from this pulpit do their work in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. A little bit of background here. I mentioned that Jesus uh, is specifically addressing two different groups of people. For the wealthy people, he concludes in verse number 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon there is a word which refers to wealth. You cannot live for two masters. You cannot live for wealth, and that is the pursuit of wealth, the love of wealth, and for the God of the Bible. You can't do it. For those who are poor, for those who are working class, he concludes his thoughts in verses 31 and 32. He says, Therefore, take no thought, or do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Now the word Gentiles here is a phrase which is meaning the unbelievers, the pagan world. Uh, and when he talks about seeking, it doesn't mean that uh, you know Jason should go and quit his job on Monday and say, I'm not going to worry about working anymore. You know, that's not what it's talking about here. It's saying the focus of your life should not be, how am I going to eat? How am I going to get something to drink? What am I going to be wearing? That should not be the focus of our life. It's kind of like you know, when Jesus says, uh, unless you hate mother and father and you know sister and brother and all those groups of people you cannot be my disciple he's not saying you ought to despise them or hate them but what he's saying is in comparison to your love for me you know the love for anyone on this earth ought to be dimmer and in the same way he's saying the focus of our life ought not be obtaining wealth the focus of our life ought not be how am I going to eat the next meal you know what am I going to wear and things like that so what should be our focus? What should we live for? If we're not living for the almighty dollar, as they call it, and I don't think that's a, an accident that they call it the almighty dollar, what should we be living for? 
And Jesus answers that question in verse number 33. But, you know, he's saying there's something higher here. There's something of everlasting value here in contrast with everything this world has to offer. But, seek ye first. In other words, this is what should be the supreme object of pursuit. You know, this is what you ought to seek before everything else. Pursuit of this should be first in importance in our lives. Now, evidently, as I studied this verse, there was a phrase that the Jewish people used back then that was common, and that was this. Seek that to which other things are necessarily connected. Seek that to which other things are necessarily connected. In other words, always go after what brings with it the most benefits. You know, just kind of on a practical level, you know, we went out west. You know, we reserved our hotels over a year in advance. And so uh, three of them had shut down. <laughs> That's another story there. But anyway, but one of the things I do is I always find a hotel that serves a breakfast. And I may have to pay one or two dollars extra but that's saving us $20. You see what I'm doing there? I'm saying, okay, I'm looking for a hotel that has breakfast in order to save $20 for our large family. Seek those things which bring with them other benefits. Let me give you a story. There was a king, and he told his friend this, ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. So what did his friend ask for? Well, he didn't ask to be a great general in the king's army. He didn't ask for, you know, wealth or this, that, or the other. But he asked for the king's daughter's hand in marriage. And the reason he asked for that is because he knew that if he married the king's daughter, he would receive all the dignities and all the blessings of the kingdom. You know, an Old Testament example of this is Solomon. You know, God went to Solomon, all-knowing God, knowing how he would respond, but, you know, when God does things like this, he's showing us more than he's showing himself. I hope you realize that. But God comes to Solomon and says, ask whatever you want. And Solomon says, well, you know, I really want to be able to rule in a way that's pleasing to you. And so I ask for wisdom. I ask for discernment and judgment. And God says, you know, you could have asked for, for riches you could have asked for victory in battle. You could have asked for all these things. But because you've asked for the right thing, all these other things you could have asked for, I'm going to give you. So that is the context in which we see seek ye first. Because if you get this straight, then everything else will fall into place. Seek ye first. What does Christ call upon his people to pursue above everything else. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now there are two parts of this. The first one is for the world, the unbelievers. The first thing is we need to make sure that we are righteous in God's sight so that we can be a part of God's kingdom. Uh, God's kingdom is made up of those whom he has called out of this sinful world for the purpose of glorifying him. Now you can study the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. There's a lot of different nuances in the Bible. There's a lot of words like salvation and, and baptism. And you've got to see them in context. And, and yes, there is a future kingdom that's coming one day. When Christ is going to rule and reign a thousand years. And then he's going to rule and reign forever and ever. And there is that kingdom. But those of us, there was a children's storybook. And one of those children's storybooks had a deep thought in it. And it said that God's kingdom is wherever Christ is on the throne. And if Christ is on the throne in our hearts, then we are a part of his kingdom here on this earth. And he's called us out in order to glorify him in the midst of this sinful world. But we have to be righteous in order to be a part of the kingdom of a holy God. So how do we obtain that righteousness? Let's look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. 
we see a man named John the Baptist. It says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Chapter 4, verse number 17. It says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John, whom some say is the last Old Testament prophet, and Jesus, the Son of God, they had the same message. And that is, if you want to be prepared for God's kingdom, the first thing you need to do is repent. Repent. Turn from your sins. Turn, repudiate your sins. Sorrow over your sins. Admit before God your sins. And that he is right and that you are wrong. Well, what do we do then? You know, there's repentance without salvation, but there's never salvation without repentance. You know, you go through life and you see people that are very discouraged and very down. and Oh, I know I'm doing wrong. I know that I'm just not living right. And they're all depressed and they're all discouraged. And sometimes they take a vice in order to try to get over that hump. Oh, woe is me. I'm cursed of God. You know, there's repentance without salvation. But there's never salvation without repentance. Look at Colossians chapter 1. What do we do when we realize that we're a sinner? And we let God know that we are sorry for our sins. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. It says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or suitable, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. How did this take place? In whom, or in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. See, after turning from our sins, we're to place our trust in the living Christ, who died on the cross to pay the price of death, the price of death that we owed for our sins in order that we might experience the forgiveness of sins. And what happens at that moment when we place our trust in the living Christ, the resurrected Christ? You know, I like that song we sang today. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We don't just trust a set of doctrines, although we do have a set of doctrines. We believe Jesus was virgin born. We believe he was sinless. We believe that he died on the cross for our sins. We believe that he rose from the dead. But we trust the person of Jesus Christ who paid the price for our sins on the cross. So what happens what is the great transaction that takes place when we trust the living Christ who died for our sins? 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is one of those verses that ought to put to memory because it describes what happens at the moment we're born again, at the moment we're saved, at the moment we're redeemed. It says, For God the Father, for He hath made Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God the Father had a plan. And that was to send his sinless son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to become sin for us. And he knew no sin. He was sinless. That we in turn, when we place our faith in him, might have our sins placed on Jesus and his righteousness imparted or imputed or given to us. So when it says in our text today, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then the first thing Jesus is calling us to is to make sure that we have turned from our sins and placed our faith in the risen Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Because until we're declared righteous, 
until we're justified in God's sight, then we're not even a part of the kingdom of God. Okay, so am I born again? That's the first thing we need to think about. But second, we need in our lives as Christians to prioritize living in such a way that is fitting for a citizen of God's kingdom. In other words, God's word is to trump every other consideration in our lives. You know, why does Jesus talk about wealth and earthly things so much in this passage? It's because he understands that this is where our focus often is when making decisions in our lives. You know, one of the things that warms my heart as I look out here today is I'd say, you know, nearly half the crowd is less than 20. <laughs> that is a, uh, a blessing to me. And so as, I, as we see these young people making decisions in their lives, then my, my challenge to you is, seek ye first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Make sure that you're a Christian, and then as you make decisions, ask yourself that little phrase that used to be on them bracelets, WWJD, you know, what would Jesus do? Now let me give you some specific temptations that I find that young people are falling into. You know, we have an epidemic, even among professing Christians, of those who are living together in an intimate relationship without getting married. Five years from now, you may have a girlfriend or have a boyfriend, some of you younger people. In fact, this is actually an epidemic. They say that the largest population this is growing among is senior citizens. Because senior citizens don't want to lose their benefits, and so they start living together. So, you know, don't be, Miss Tressy, don't be inviting anybody to come live with you. If you do, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and get married. But what is the main reason people give for doing this? The main reason people give is finances. Finances. Either they feel like they can't afford to get married or they don't want to lose certain government benefits. I knew a couple over in Kentucky, and he had a job. He was making money, but they never got married because she had three kids, and she was getting benefits, and he had his job. But the fact of the matter is this. When you live together and have an improper relationship because you're not married, you are violating the seventh commandment. And it's sin. So what should you do if you're a couple thinking about this? Well, you have two choices. You can take financial matters into concern and, you know, physical feelings into concern. Or you can seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added to you. Let me give you another illustration. You know, many professing Christians, as you get older... You know, I know these other parents in here, you know, someone was talking about on Facebook how they had an empty nest. And I'm like, well, that's a lot better than the alternative, okay? <laughs> one day you're going to be out there. You're going to be getting a job to provide for yourself and for your family one day. And I want to challenge you. There are places that will force you to work on the Lord's Day, on Sunday. But if a job is not necessary such as a medical field or law enforcement or military or something like that, a Christian should tell his employer, I'm a Christian. The Bible commands me to worship God and rest one day out of seven. I ask for Sundays off, and if I cannot get Sundays off, I'll be praying about finding new employment. That doesn't mean going up and quit your job. But what you're telling your manager is, and in this hot job market right now, where people are looking for workers left and right, you know, you can find a job. They will work with you. And just tell them that. But what is the given reason why people work on the Lord's Day, on Sunday? Finances. Finances. Yet in most cases, 
It is a violation of the fourth commandment, and therefore it is sin. So what should people do in that situation? When we determine to live as obedient subjects in God's kingdom. And by the way, I want to say this. Years ago, you know, it's neat to look back over life. There's a John W. Peterson song, Jesus Led Me All the Way. I love that old John W. Peterson song. And I remember years ago, Jason had an opportunity. And he could make lots of money. He could go up north. And he said, you know what? I have a little girl here. She needs her daddy. And I'm not moving up north. And here he is going to get a pair of shoes with her today. Let me tell you something. You seek first God's kingdom. And you seek first his righteousness. And then what's the promise? All these things shall be added unto you. All these things. We see that in verse number 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. It refers to food. It refers to drink. It refers to clothing. All the necessities of life. If we are God's children through Christ, and if we choose to live daily for God's pleasure and His alone, then God promises to give us everything we need to live. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Look at the book of Psalms. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. The psalmist knew this. The psalmist David knew this. Verses 6 through 10 of Psalm 34. This was when he was running away from King Saul. He was a fugitive. He was a fugitive from justice, so to speak. And he says in verse 6, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. But the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near unto them that are of a broken heart, and save such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Wonderful promise. God hears the righteous. God takes care of the righteous. It says sometimes young lions, they may lack food because mama lion can't get back to them or daddy lion or whoever feeds lions. But it says here, they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Now what's a good thing? That's like Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good them who love God, to them are the called according to his purpose. Well, what is his purpose? God's purpose is to make us like Christ. And so, you know, what is good? Well, anything we need, God promises to supply to those who are righteous, to those who are his children. Psalm 37, Psalm 37, a psalm of David. Verse number 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. I like that. Verse 16. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. 
They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. Verse 26. I mean, verse 25. I have been old, young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful, and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. God takes care of the righteous, and God makes sure that we are fed. I've always liked that verse. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. In Psalm 84, Psalm 84, verses 11 and 12. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. No good thing will God withhold from them that walk uprightly. You know, I think about my son Trey. He's a senior in high school this year. And uh, he's getting ready to take his ACT test in October, which is a college, college entrance exam test in October. And one of the things that we have as a priority for him and as a priority for our other children is we want him to spend at least a year in a Christian or a Bible college. You say, well, man, you know, you can get free college at UVA Wise, you know, if you make less than 40000 a year. I'd say that's most of us in here. You know, if you just get good grades, you can go for free, and he makes good grades. You know, why do you want to spend that money? Well, there's a philosophy I have based upon this verse, Matthew 6, 33. And that is, if my children can get the vertical right, which is their relationship with God, and especially if they can get it right, when they start out and they begin their lives, then the horizontal will just take care of itself. And the horizontal will be just fine. You get this right, this will be great. That's true with marriage, is it not? When we're walking with Christ each day, then the marriage becomes sweeter. It becomes better. Everything Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus calls upon us as his followers to live our 